Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Max Carlson. I am a PhD student at the University of Utah in the School of Computing. Um, as of this summer, I've been working as an intern for uh, Sandia National Labs. Um, I've been working on a, the performance portability of Albany Land Dice in conjunction with Jerry Watkins and uh, Irina Tazar, also at Sandia. Um, so I'm here today to present some of the, the work that I've been helping out with. Um, and uh, it, it pertains mostly to the evaluation of boundary conditions in Albany Land Dice. Um, so with uh, that in mind, uh, let me get started. Um, so this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Albany Land, Dice, Albany Land Dice is for those who are not aware, and then some of the details of the actual uh, work being done, and then some performance results. Uh, so Albany Land Dice is a model for uh, modeling uh, glaciers and ice sheets as, uh, first, as using a first order approximation of Stokes flow. Um, so the velocity of the ice sheet is modeled as a uh, um, using a system of steady state equations of this first order Stokes approximation. And then they, these velocity equations are coupled to dynamics equations for um, ice thickness and temperature. Um, so the Albany land ice model interfaces with E3SM, which has been mentioned previously um, to the MPASS framework, uh, the uh, multi-scale prediction and across scales framework. Um, and that, that project is called uh, MALI. Uh, so that allows for variable resolution uh, meshes and, and, things, and interfaces with E3SM. Um, so work has been ongoing for the Albany Land Ice uh, project to, uh, to modernize the code to performance, for, for performance portable C++ code uh, so that um, we can do runs on high-end GPU computing clusters like Summit or um, some of the other ones, like upcoming ones like Perlmutter. Um, so work is, is ongoing on this project. And in previous, uh, previous iterations of this work, uh, the, the velocity portion of the finite element assembly was, was ported to um, Cocos for um, GPU runs. So this summer, I helped out to work on, the, uh, on porting the, the enthalpy part of the finite, um, uh, finite element assembly code to, uh, to perform as portable Cocos. And additionally, working on the boundary condition evaluation uh, and porting that as well. So the velocity problem assembly does not have any of the boundary conditions uh, ported to GPUs or Cocos yet. So this was kind of a, um, a proof of concept for a, 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 a performant boundary condition evaluation. Um, so the main goal of this project was to achieve uh, high performance on, on GPU clusters for the you know the fully coupled problem. But I mean, the the side goal and just as important is to achieve a high degree of performance portability for um, as you I'm sure are all aware at this point. So, and just to recap, performance portability is this idea that um, improvements to raw processing power has just has slowed down to the point where um, we, we need to use specialized computing architectures. They're all aware of at this point, like GPUs and um, special um, architectures of CPUs and then customizable things like FPGAs. Um, Learning, all, uh, it, writing code that takes advantage of all of these different programming models requires programmers to understand each programming model and, and how to attain high performance and, and maintaining a code that has uh, branches for each of these types of architectures without, without some middleman is, is, is infeasible. Uh, and another thing there is that domain experts shouldn't have to be exposed to those performance concerns. Like, so you want these kinds of things to be hidden, but uh, available. Uh, and there are obviously some, some frameworks that exist for, for, for handling uh, this performance portability. Uh, they, so some of them are like Intel One API and Hipsicle and, and, and Raja. And, and as mentioned previously, Cocos, which is um, what I'll be talking about today. Uh, it's Cocos is a, a performance portability framework that has been developed by Sandia. Um, so that's uh, what I will be, this will be using in this project. Uh, so since this uh, work is largely about attaining high performance on GPUs, um, I just kind of wanted to recap some ideas from uh, that that might be important to know for understanding performance. Uh, specifically, uh, GPUs have their own memory space that, uh, so Data has to be moving back and forth. Data has to be moved back and forth between the host and the device, uh, which is expensive and needs to be minimized as much as possible. 
and and that's like the first level of the memory hierarchy then once we have memory on the or once data is on the device and global memory it has to be moved into shared memory or local uh, thread memory um, so we want to minimize all of these data movements as much as possible because they tend to be very expensive on the um, on the GPU. And not only do we want to minimize the amount of move data movement, but we want to maximize the amount of um, throughput that is being utilized during the during operation. Uh, so thread blocks are designed to load data from global memory in contiguous blocks. Um, this and this type of access is known as what's known as coalesced versus uh, like random access, which is inefficient uh, on, uh, on GPUs. So uh, to achieve uh, efficient memory access, we like to have data in contiguous blocks, for how we're gonna um, use it. So anyway, that's just a little bit of background on, on GPU performance. Um, so let's talk about the actual work that we, we did um, this summer and are continuing to do. All right, so, so Albany is Sandia's uh, is a is a library that was developed by San, in, at Sandia National Laboratories. That's an object oriented parallel C plus plus code for discretizing and solving PDEs. It uses the finite element method on unstructured grids, and it's tightly coupled with another um, with 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 another library called the Trillinos that is actually a collection of uh, of libraries, and a lot of and it's, some of them are used uh, in Albany for uh, Albany Land Ice. So the general pipeline kind of looks like Albany uses finite elements to construct a system and then it hands it off to Trilinos that does the actual solve phase. So the pipeline can be seen in the diagram in the bottom right where we have these yellow circles that correspond to uh, distributed memory operations where data is moved to proper MPI ranks. And then once they're there, we have the blue rectangles which are like the shared memory operations. Um, the gather and scatter uh, um, categories here are largely already ported to Cocos. So the work that I did was uh, focused mainly on the interpolate and evaluate um, categories. So each of these blue rectangles also has a corresponding um, directed acyclic graph that is managed by a, a Trillinos package called Phalanx. Um, and, and each of the nodes in that graph is what we refer to as an evaluator. So uh, each evaluator does things like interpolating uh, values from cell centers to quadrature points or something like that, and then evaluate uh, handles evaluators that are like the, related to the physics of the problem, the actual finite element assembly. Um, so that's, that's kind of the overall pipeline here. Um, so yeah, so we broke, so the evaluators kind of come in two flavors and interpolate and evaluate. There's, there's volume evaluators, which are those that are just, um, they're updating some value for every cell in a mesh and then potentially over every quadrature point or et cetera. Uh, and then there are those that are um, specifically related to boundary conditions, and they have a little bit different um, structure. So the, this this work can kind of be separated into a volume refactor and then a boundary condition refactor. So first, I just want to briefly mention the volume refactor. It, it was relatively straightforward since the volume refactors are basically, I mean, so here's just a very, very simple example of one of the volume evaluators that is just a loop over the, all the cells and then a loop over all the quadrature points and then an update of this dissipation um, for each uh, point. Uh, so the, the one commonality between all the volume eva evaluators is that they have this outer loop over all of the cells, which, which um, corresponds to the vast majority of the work. So the volume refactor, we, we parallelize along the, um, the number of cells using a Cocos parallel for, uh, using a Cocos parallel for, and then we, we create this operator that we pass into the, the parallel for. And, uh, the benefit of this is it it's very readable. Um, it looks almost exactly the same as the original um, implementation, um, but just moved into this other operator. Um, using just a simple parallelization strategy like this, we can get a lot of uh, I mean, this this improved performance dramatically. Um, there there's still things we can do to optimize uh, here, but it it got us most of the way there. So uh, that's that's what we have here. And then um, yeah, so so the volume evaluators are are, are almost completely data parallel so we can just do this without having to worry too much about um like um yeah uh so yeah that's the volume refactor it's it's pretty straightforward um so then the boundary conditions are a lot more uh, involved because the 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 way that um boundary conditions are represented by albany is not exactly uh ready for um uh, wasn't exactly ready for a cocos or gpu um implementation. So the reason for this is, uh, so as so a boundary um, data, so, so boundary maps were represented as a, uh, originally 
represented as an array of structures. Um, so in this diagram, it's the upper uh, part of the diagram where each entry of the array was a structure that had all sorts of indexing information, um, like side index and, a, and a global local indices, things like that. Um, this was uh, not great for uh, GPU access because every evaluator didn't necessarily need all of the information within a single um, element of this array. So we replaced this with a structure of Cocos views that were A, I mean, accessible to the device, uh, but then also separated into contiguous uh, Cocos views for each of the fields within the structures. Uh, this was beneficial because, I mean, we, each GPU evaluator doesn't or each evaluator on the GPU doesn't necessarily need every field. So whatever fields are being accessed can be accessed in a contiguous block in a coalesced fashion without touching anything that isn't, isn't necessary. So that, that was the first step in achieving um, efficient uh, loads for the, these evaluators. Uh, the downside of this, uh, so I mean, so this, this was nice. So being able to access the boundary maps uh, in, a, in a coalesced fashion was, was, was a good first step. Uh, the problem was is that um, the, the, bound, the fields themselves that corresponded to boundaries, boundary conditions were laid out the same way as the, the, the volume fields. So basically, there were a lot of so there we use this map to point to the 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 elements in the array that actually corresponded to boundaries, and the rest was just untouched. So the, the next step of this was to was to update the the layouts for the boundary fields so that they matched the same layout as the the side set mappings. Um, so this way, the the boundary fields themselves. Um, we're, we're able to be accessed in a coalesced fashion in the same way as the side set mapping itself. Uh, so, so this is nice. So now, now the, all, all of the loads can be done in a, a coalesced fashion. There is still the, the problem of the, what, what some, of the, one of the, some of the evaluators write and accumulate to a, a volume field. And this, this will always end up being a random access uh, a write because this is, uh, and that's just by nature of, of the, the, the computation. So the other thing we did was then to, re, to, to transform some of the evaluators so that things, so all the computation could be done locally. And then at the very end of the, the, the kernel, we would actually do the write to the volume field. So th this reduced the number of writes in this to the volume field. And it, yeah, so the, this, so it was unavoidable to do these writes, but this minimized the amount of them that we had to do, and it did it once the computation was done. Um, so then there was one more thing to add with the with the boundary uh, refactor is that we ran into a performance corner case uh, that that had to be handled because uh, when initializing a mesh initially, um, so Albany separates work into smaller work sets um, to handle large problem sizes. But it, it also does this when initializing a mesh and it separates the mesh into work sets that contain only a single cell of the original mesh. So the number of work sets was also the number of cells in the mesh. So the boundary mapping structure was being allocated for each work set sequentially on the device, which ended up taking up a, a huge amount of time. So uh, we, we separated the boundary, map, boundary mapping structure into a global and a local structure so that the global structure could contain all the boundary data for all the work sets and was allocated once just right up front. And then the local structures for each work set was then um, contains Coco subviews that just looked into the global structure. So this helped us avoid that uh, corner case that showed up when initializing a mesh and didn't have any other um, um, performance impacts, um, but it was necessary. So, Okay, so now that I've talked a little bit about what the, the volume and the boundary condition refactors are, I kind of want to get into the, the performance results to, to show that we've achieved the performant um, GPU evaluation of the finite element assembly. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so the experimental setup, uh, the problem that we're solving is the, the, the enthalpy part of the, um, the, the enthalpy, enthalpy part of the finite element assembly on a variable resolution mesh of the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, this variable resolution mesh was uh, from one kilometer to 10 kilometers in resolution. Uh, and yeah, so that, that, that's, that was the problem that we used to, to test uh, the performance. Um, we, we used a couple of uh, in-house uh, computing clusters at Sandia that have a couple of different node configurations, uh, one of which has uh, four NVIDIA V100 GPUs per node. And these same nodes also have dual socket power nine CPUs with 
40 cores, 40, co 40 cores per node with 20 cores per socket. And then another cluster with dual socket Haswell CPUs with 32 cores per node or 16 cores per socket. And then another cluster with single socket Knight's Landing CPUs with 64 cores per node. Um, so these were the node configurations that we used. And then we also had um, three different branches of code that we wanted to profile. Uh, the first is the original code before we did any refactoring, although uh, uh, before I did any refactoring, there was also uh, some work had already been done um, to refactor some of like the interpolation uh, evaluators. So there was the original code and then the, the volume refactor that I worked on and then the, the full volume plus boundary conditions um, branch. So each of these branches was uh, built using a different Cocos backend, depending on uh, what architecture we were running on. That, that could either be CUDA, OpenMP, or Serial, where there's just no parallelism at all. Um, so all, all of these uh, cases will be explained on, uh, in, the, um, in the performance results. So the, the first thing we wanted to see was that, uh, is the CUDA, is the, are these CUDA refactors actually giving, uh, um, bringing us into a um, good, good performance range. Uh, so the first thing was to check against the original CUDA build, which had a really bad runtime, mostly because it was not really running on the GPU for the most part. Um, so there was this issue of moving data back and forth, but then also not having as enough as many ranks as uh, or MPI ranks as a, a, a serial run would actually have. So the speed up there is is a little bit um, misleading, but. When we compare it against some of the other uh, architectures and backends, um, we, we do see some pretty good speed ups. Like, so comparing against uh, an MPI only uh, serial run on the Power9 uh, CPUs, we saw like a 4.4x speed up or 6, 6x speed up once we added the boundary conditions in. Um, so yeah, so the, we also wanted to test how things worked on other architectures. So we took a look at some Knight's Landing um, CPUs to see what happened there um, using OpenMP and um, serial backends. Uh, we, we also saw some speed up here with 1.4x with the volume uh, and then 1.6 over the um, serial build. The, the boundary condition uh, branch didn't really show any speed up for the OpenMP uh, Knight's Landing runs because uh, all of that was really just specific to GPUs. Um, and so the, the fact that the volume branch uh, got this kind of speed up was was kind of an added bonus just because we were using uh, Cocos to handle the performance portability aspects of things. Uh, yeah, so yeah, so this is just so this was just some uh, rough speed up calculations here, and then um, we did a strong scaling test to determine what things look like. Um, so the strong scaling for the GPUs is looking great, except for once you hit sixteen. Oh, so sixteen nodes. Uh, it starts to taper off a little bit, um, and this is this is when you get to the point where the amount of data on each GPU is starting to get a little thin compared to um, is is just a little thin. So it's like the the saturation of the, each GPU is is not quite there. Um, so we're getting into latency bound issues. Uh, the the overall speed up over like the Haswell OpenMP build is only about two point four x, which is a little less than we would expect. Um, so we, we kind of looked into this to see what was going on. And we, we did a, a timing breakdown uh, in categories to see what was taking the time. Um, so we found out that there were these uh, um, groups of evaluators uh, called save state evaluators and load state evaluators that were taking up a huge percentage of the, uh, the overall finite assembly time. Uh, so this, th these, these evaluators are only to kind of change the format of the fields to be ready for uh, input and output. Uh, they can't really be ported to the GPU and they, so they're, they're, they're not getting any sort of GPU acceleration. And so they're, um, yeah, they're, they're really slow and they're potentially unnecessary. We're looking into to solutions to get around um, needing the save and load states. Uh, so when, once we have that, I, we think that the, um, the, the performance should be more the performance speed up over Haswell OpenMP should look a lot more like what we're expecting. And the reason for that is that while this, this save state and load state happens on CPU or GPUs, uh, it's, it has a really dramatic performance impact on GPUs. So I, we think that once these can be um, eliminated from the overall runtime, that we'll start to see things that are more like what you'd expect. Um, so yeah, there, that's, 
yeah, that's what you can see there. Like, so the load state, if we remove that as well, then the, perform the, the overall runtime will be dominated by the evaluate and interpolate and a little bit because of the compute basis functions. Um, but so that's, that's more what we would be expecting. Uh, so with that in mind, then we wanted to do some uh, um, kernel by kernel profiling to see how we're doing with the volume and the boundary condition kernels to see if we're where, where we expect and what can be improved. So here's, uh, here's some of the results from that using the Nvi NVIDIA's uh, profiler. Um, so the, the experimental setup here is that we use two nodes, so a total of eight GPUs on the Greenland ice sheet mesh. Um, so the amount of data for the volume evaluator is, is something like many hundreds of thousands of cells, so like closer to a million. Um, so we're at the point where each GPU is getting a lot of data um, fed through it. So we're, this is like an example of uh, what we would we'd want. So it's, it's kind of a more of a bandwidth bound case. Uh, so we're, see, we're seeing really high device memory read and write throughputs. Um, and then the, the load and store efficiencies are perfect in all cases. Uh, the, achi the achieved occupancy achieved occupancy is a little bit variable. Um, we, we could probably improve this for temperature and enthalpy residual by uh, um, limiting the number of registers per per kernel, but it, it probably doesn't have as dramatic of impact. Um, so the 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 right throughput for the enthalpy residual is a little bit low. So that's something that we could also uh, um, maybe take a look at, see what's going on. So so these kernels do eventually. The, the throughputs drop a bit as you um, reduce the amount of data per per node. Uh, so, but it's not quite as dramatic as for the boundary conditions. So, for the boundary condition evaluators, uh, here are some of the results for the, the the two node case. We're actually still seeing pretty high throughput. So, in this case, there's maybe like eighty thousand um, cells that are being um, um, operated on. So, it's 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 enough to get decent throughputs for the uh, um, for these evaluators, but it doesn't take very much to um, reduce that number to a point where we're not saturating the GPUs. So at four, four nodes and eight nodes, this drops off a bit. Uh, so we, for this case, we're seeing good um, throughputs, but eventually, but very quickly, we run into latency bound uh, regime. Uh, so the load and store efficiencies for, for, for most of the evaluators for the boundary conditions are, are perfect. Um, aside from the enthalpy basal residual, which the stores are obviously going to be 25% um, because um, we're writing into this volume field and it's essentially random, random access writes. So there's nothing we can really do to avoid that. The load efficiency is not quite perfect and that's something that um, we need to look into to see why that's not 100% because it, it probably should be. Um, but yeah, and then again, the achieved occupancy is, a, is a, about 50% and maybe that could be improved, but yeah, so here, here in both cases, we're seeing that we will we'll, we'll move into latency bound issues or latency bound regime as we uh, reduce the, the volume of data on each uh, node. So we have some ideas on how to handle this case, um, one of which is to utilize hierarchical parallelism using um, CUDA graphs or, well, so specifically Cocos uh, has, is, is working on a, um, something like CUDA graphs so that we could schedule uh, multiple latency bound kernels to run concurrently. Um, so this, this would be nice for, uh, this, this could potentially get us around this issue um, uh, using the phalanx graphs that we're working with already. So we'd just be able to take those phalanx graphs for the, that, that maps all the evaluators and then uh, give it to Cocos and set up a CUDA graph and potentially run some of these kernels um, concurrently. Uh, so then some other future work that, that would be done on this project is that, um, so this, this was kind of a proof of concept for the boundary con condition evaluation on GPUs for the enthalpy problem. Uh, so this could then be extended and is being currently extended to the, the velocity problem. And then I'm wrapping that up um, within a few days, actually. And uh, we're going to start testing that. So with that and the, uh, um, so, so the velocity and the enthalpy problem, the finite element assembly should be essentially ported to GPUs fully at this point. So the only remaining work would be then to work on the, uh, the linear solver phase, which is now the dominant time taken during the full solve. Uh, so part of this is on Trilino's side, part of this is on our side, and we're going to be um, working on making this fully, um, fully ported to Cocos and GPUs. And at that point, we're going to start doing full end-to-end -end coupled problem solves on uh, large clusters like Summit and Perlmutter. 
Um, so that's, that's all I've got. Uh, so I guess now we can move on to questions. So thank you all for, for listening. <laughs>